Welcome, folks. I'll tell you what, this is our second edition of Pete and John Talk Fishing, brought to you by Amsoil. Well, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing good. Uh, there's still snow here, but uh, other than that, I'm great, and spring is right around the corner, and that's what we're going to talk about, right? Uh, yeah, actually, what we're going to do is preview the month of April for all the Midwest anglers. Uh, we're going to talk about places to go, techniques, uh, fishing opportunities. And uh, before I do that, I want to mention to you that I spent uh, a couple of weeks down in Florida. And uh, I, you sent me pictures of the wonderful snow in your backyard. <laughs> yes, I did. And I was quite jealous of you being down in Florida. But... Uh... There was so much snow up here, you know, you had to, well, you had to be shoveling all the time. Somebody's got to do it. Well, I was talking to Josh over in Duluth, and he's not too far from you. Actually, he's in the Ashland area, and they've got waist-deep snow in the woods. Is that the same in Hayward? Oh, uh, yeah. The uh, it, it really is, uh, you know, since I've been an adult, uh, it's about the worst I've ever seen that I can remember anyway. So, yeah, the... Uh, the woods, uh, you really basically can't go into. I've, I've literally had my uh, dogs stuck uh, when they get off trail in the woods where they literally, they, they can't find the bottom anywhere. And you get some funny stuff where they're trying to dig and they can literally disappear in the snow. And So yeah, there's lots of snow. You can shovel if you want. No, that's okay. Uh, let's switch gears now and talk about something more pleasant like yeah. the month of April. And April really is a tremendous month to get in a boat and, and fish walleyes in not only Wisconsin, but Minnesota, Illinois River down in Illinois. There's just a wide array of opportunities. And uh, I guess, first of all, we can talk locations. Uh, one of the spots that I have never fished, Pete, and you have is the Rainy River up in northern Minnesota, which borders areas of Canada and Minnesota. That is a trophy walleye deal up there and a sturgeon deal up there too uh, in April, isn't it? Yeah, you know, I've only done it a few times, but it's uh, it's a tremendous fishery, uh, twice for, for walleye and, and once for the sturgeon. And it's it's really good. Uh, I, I, I talk to a lot of people. I haven't actually done it in uh, probably five years now, but uh, it's still very good. And as you mentioned, actually for the sturgeon too, but it's a, it's a trophy wall ideal. I mean, they really get some nice big fish this time of the year. And, uh, and, and yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you know, they're on the, a spawning run and they're usually pretty predictable, can get pretty stacked up and it, it's tremendous fishing. And of course, when you're way up north, first place you can go on a boat. So it's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So the Rainy River is one. And I'm going to start, I guess, with my locations down in, in Wisconsin. And then, of course, uh, uh, the Bay of Green Bay is a fabulous fishery in, in the month of April. And already in March, on the warmer days, there was a lot of guys, a lot of guys fishing the Fox River and De Pere and, and doing really, really well. And uh, Actually, we filmed the show in De Pere in December, and there were tons of 18 to 22-inch males in there. But uh, beginning in, in March and through April, the females come in, and, and that's still a wonderful place to catch a trophy fish this time of year, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's tremendous fishing over there as well, and, and again, bigger fish. I mean, it's 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 really prime time if, if somebody's a, a trophy seeker, you know, in, in reality, there's not not very many places you can actually technically, you know, you're able to fish these fish legally pre-spawn. So uh, obviously prior to that, you've got the, uh, you know, the, the egg weight still in the fish and they're just massive, beautiful fish. But either way, even if it's post-spawn a little bit, I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're great big fish. I mean, your odds of catching a fish over 30 inches are really pretty good. If you put in several days, you're probably going to have that happen, and that's exceptional. And, you know, that is interesting. You know, you mentioned that, you know, you have the opportunity to fish in pre-spawn. There are also special limits on the Fox River in Green Bay in the spring. You're only allowed to keep one fish a day over 28 inches. So they're actually protecting the females from harvest, and that's a good deal. But on the other hand, like you said, guys can go out 
and have an opportunity to catch a, catch a real big one. And then, of course, you move up the west side of Green Bay, and you also have uh, the Peshtigo River and the O'Connell River and the Menominee River, which borders uh, uh, Wisconsin and Michigan. And all those rivers kind of, you know, the Peshtigo is a little later than the Fox River. The O'Connell is a little later. Menominee stays good almost all the way through the first week of May. And uh, those are wonderful areas to fish. You know, you get up to Peshtigo, it's almost like you're in Canada. It's beautiful water too, isn't it? Well, that's kind of the amazing thing. And, uh, you know, there's there's a lot to explore, uh, you know, over here. But, you know, the St. Croix and we've got tons of rivers as well that you can actually get on pretty early and fish bass and stuff. But there you can actually fish the walleyes and uh and yeah it's, it's pretty amazing if you fished out on the bay yet never been up some of those rivers over there uh yeah it's it, it's a whole different world to a certain extent it's like you just snuck into canada somehow uh, got the got the eight hour drive over with and and bang there you are but uh yeah it's it's beautiful and of course the fishing can be tremendous when they're when they're up in there i mean the numbers that go up in they're just just really amazing. You can have amazing numbers days as well as, you know, catching some quality fish. And, you know, we got to talk, too, about uh, what the fish need to go up these rivers on the west side of the Bay of Green Bay, and that's melt-off or rain. Right now, all the rivers over there are kind of low, but when the melt-off comes and, and the current starts moving, that's what draws the fish into these rivers, right? Oh, well, there's no doubt about that. And uh, it's been a long winter around here, but it's it's literally that time of the year. It's it's happening soon. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing is now the sun is so much stronger as well. I mean, that melt off starts before it even gets above freezing to a certain extent, if it's a sunny day, obviously. But uh yeah, we're we're there. I mean, it it, it seems weird uh, for me personally right now talking to this because we we still have uh snow seemingly up to my neck but uh we're we're just a couple weeks away from uh really prime time for all of this and then of course uh you know the the other thing that uh that that's available fairly close here is uh you know the the lake superior schwamigan bay system all of that and the you know the the potential that they have there i mean you know in places like saxon harbor they're out early i mean i would expect to hear some news on that fairly soon uh, and then obviously you can, uh, you, you can fish for all kinds of stuff there as well. So, you know, you got the trout. Now we're talking uh, Great Lakes fish, more coal and, and browns and that type of deal. Oh yeah. But the, and, and the, yeah, the, the, the Lakers will come up shallow as well, but, uh, you know, I, I, the staples in recent years have been the, been the coals and the browns and the splake, uh, generally pretty shallow. Uh, in a lot of cases, you know, you're going to find these fish up in as little as, as, as three, four feet of water. But also in a lot of cases, you can take off, they'll be suspended out over deeper ranges as well. And you can literally just start driving around, uh, running running the same baits uh, up high that you could, you, you're basically saying the same, the, staying with the same spread that you would shallow and just going out over deeper water. And, and and being able to experience, you know, again, it's a wide variety. You don't really know what you're going to catch next. And it, it could be a northern pike as well. I mean, it's not just the, not just the trout and salmon that you might run into. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a fun time. Well, now that you're talking a little bit about Great Lakes fish, too, I got to mention, too, that the perch bite's been pretty good down in southern Lake Michigan in Indiana. But the cohos are what everybody wants in the month of April. And they start their migration down there around Calumet, Indiana. And they're, they work their way up all the way to the western shoreline of Lake Michigan. And uh, I need for you to come down and do that with me because it's flatline trolling, uh, you know, Livingston jerk bakes or rapellas or husky jerks. And it's just a kill fest. And I'm serious. You can keep <laughs> five a day in there, those beautiful two to three to four pound cohos. And, you know, they're put, it's a put and take fishery. I mean, you know, those fish are planted, we catch them and eat them. But uh, that starts in, the, in southern Indiana, then Waukegan, and then Milwaukee, Port Washington, Sheboygan. And they'll be all up and down the shoreline. And, and you know, only about 30, 40 feet of water, flat line trolling uh, with boards. 
and seriously, I had Rob down there one year. We couldn't keep up, and we were fishing in four footers. But that is another another wonderful fishery. Back to the walleyes. I want to finish up with the rivers here. Um, you know, for many years, how many years I've been doing my TV show now, 30 or 31 or whatever. Spent a lot of those years with Big Dave on the Wisconsin River in the Dells. Oh, right. And people shouldn't forget about that. That is a wonderful early year of walleye fishery. The fish migrate from Lake Wisconsin up the Wisconsin River to the Dells Dam. And uh, you'll catch a trophy now and then, but you can just have a blast catching those, you know, 15 to 24 inch fish. And it's really a good time. And can't forget the Mississippi River here, Pete. Uh, I fished that quite a bit the last few springs. Uh, La Crosse area is wonderful. Uh, Red Wing, Minnesota is wonderful. And uh, those will just give you some of the ideas of the areas that we fish. Now, we got to get to techniques, early spring techniques. Before that, I forgot one other location, and that is uh, the east side of the Bay of Green Bay, uh, Door County. I, you and I went over there a couple of times, and it was cold, and it was windy. But tell the folks, uh, the walleyes, and, and northern pike, actually, too, that we caught over there. That was late April. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the whole thing. It's, it, it, it's coming up soon, and, and you really don't know uh, what you might catch. And, and, yeah, there's some just beautiful, awesome pike in there, as well as the walleyes. I mean, we always want to talk about walleyes, I guess, because that's the main target generally doing it. But, uh, yeah, you you know, you, you got a shot at, at a bunch of different types of quality fish there. Uh, mistake fish are kind of fun if you get them, especially if they're great big toothy critters. But the uh, uh, first time I tried it, I was I was actually amazed over there. I you know it's not a it's not a huge numbers game it seems like, but boy the the quality of the fish is just really tremendous, and they're so much fun if you can get them uh, casting, jigging, you know the way we like to do it. It's uh, you know the 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 strikes are amazing in the cooler water. Uh, to me, that's the the funnest part about it just you know getting getting those first few whacks of the year on a crankbait and and you know i, I musky or uh, walleyes are not known for being that aggressive you know a lot of people think of them as a you know a bottom fish that sucks up a leech or a minnow once in a while i mean the way they hit a crankbait or a fast dropping jig what you like to use i mean it's it is a lot of fun and if it's a 10 pound fish, it's a pretty amazing fight too. And ge ge uh, geographically, uh, that area that you can really um, uh, uh, look to in the on the east side of the bay is the east side of University Bay, which is actually in Green Bay, the city of Green Bay. Then I kind of skip up to Dykesville and that whole shoreline is, is really, really good fishing the brake lines. Brake lines are, are pretty sharp eight to 30 feet eight to 20 feet and uh that area from little sturgeon all the way north to egg harbor boy i'll tell you what that's great trophy walleye fishing and i wanted to tell you one thing you know we, we shot an ice fishing show actually a couple times uh, this year over on the west side of the bay of green bay and do you want to know pete this is going to make you smile the number of bigger pike that i have seen the last couple of years on the Bay of Green Bay is is really, really exciting. And, you know, they had that high water, which created really good spawn situations for a couple of years. And we're seeing some big pike. One thing I wanted to, to have you comment on, they still got the five fish limit over there. And I would really like to urge guys to be conservative on these big pike. I mean, they're catching a lot of mid 30 to low 40 inch fish. And um, and I it makes me sad because I'm seeing some guys with four or five fish on the ice. And, and I'd really like to see this become a trophy fishery again, like it was in the 50s. Well, that's a really good point. And uh, I mean, everybody knows me. I had to, I, I almost kind of quivered a little bit earlier when you were talking about the put and take fishery there for the for the co-host on that. <laughs> Because you know me, I'm Mr. Catch and Release, but it is a that's a different story with a put and take fishery like that. But uh, the story you're talking about with these northern pike and the Bay of Green Bay, I mean, that is something that that realistically there's there's opportunities there that 
Uh, you know, for, for about a decade, I, I spent a lot of time, as you know, up uh, chasing the biggest northern pike I could find in uh, the northern reaches of, of Canada in, uh, in, in Saskatchewan and Northwest Territories. And it's, uh, it's amazing to experience uh, northern pike uh, on a regular basis that are, that are over 20 pounds and even pushing 30 pounds. And that's the kind of thing that you could literally have with the Bay of Green Bay. It, it was that way before, and and there's still some super quality fish there. But I mean, to me, that's such a unique opportunity. Uh, you know, I I guess technically, I'd I'd like to see the DNR to a certain point maybe regulate it with some slots and lower limits and that type of thing. But hopefully, people just consider. Uh, the the growth potential there is absolutely proven. Obviously, there's tons of forage. You know, the muskies, the walleyes, everything there, I guess, really has huge trophy potential. But, uh, you know, let let it come back. There's there's not enough numbers there, in my opinion. Uh, and in uh, any time you, you you're making harvest decisions, that's how you should make them. I mean, if there were a whole pile of northern pike. Uh, you know, arguably where the gray line is of too many, that's when you, that's when you harvest to eat. But when you've got the combination of a potential trophy fishery, possibly like none other in North American continent, and then, you know, you don't have much for numbers. You just, you know, I, I would like to see that more of a catch and release fishery to see the potential of what you could have there. Well, uh, the only thing I disagree with you there is I think the numbers of bigger fish is increasing dramatically because I, I fish that a lot and I'm seeing a lot more nice fish being caught uh, compared to seven, eight years ago. We were catching, you know, these little guys, you know, but uh, I think it's coming back. But yeah, people really take care of that. Two other walleye spots, uh, obviously Lake Winnebago, the Fox River and the Wolf River are good for about a week. You know, you got about a week window there when they're coming up to spawn in a week window when they're going back. Not a lot of big fish, but a lot of good eating fish. And then, of course, I want to mention to you Lake Erie, which uh, I go to to load my freezer. And I don't need to keep a walleye at any other time other than when I go to Erie because the limit is six a day, no possession limit, and they urge you, urge you to keep every fish that you catch. And in April, you can catch them on a hair jigs. And as you get a little, and it's all males, but the males are 22 inches long. So who cares? Right. And uh, you get into late April and May, the trollers get the big females. So that's another tremendous fishery. All right. Should we get into uh, some techniques? And uh, I want to tell the folks that you and I fish together at least a couple of times every spring, uh, more in May than we do in April. But... Uh, you have been kicking my butt the last several years on this Livingston jerkbait. And I mean, I, seriously, folks, where it gets to the point where he's seven or eight to one and uh, Tex is in the boat and he's using his minnows and his jigs and he's getting beat. But this jerkbait, you want to hold that jerkbait up. Now, this has you have really taught me how effective this bait can be in the spring. Yeah, this is the uh, shallow model. It's a Jerkmaster 121, it's called. And there is another model with a longer lip uh, that that I use. Essentially, the shallower model, John, uh, if I'm fishing uh, 10 feet of water and shallower, I use that. Uh, the the deeper model, you know, from from 10 feet down to, down to 20, so I can get down there a little bit deeper. But uh, it's just... Uh, it's it's to me the funnest way to fish for them. Like I say, there 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 is no other way that you would get as hard of a hit, in my opinion, as a neutrally buoyant crankbait like that. the The hits are even harder, in my opinion, than than rip jigging, where they kind of catch it as it's dropping to a certain extent. Uh, so it's it, it's just a lot of fun, and that cold water time of year is just overall it seems to be when it's most effective you know you it's always interesting we we talk about it all the time and i think it for good reason i mean it's great advice and it's an advantage to have multiple anglers in the boat 
so like you say, you know, you'd, a lot of times there'll be four of it, you know, Tex will be there, Blake will be there, you're there. We're all trying different things. And in a lot of cases, it ends up to be that, uh, that Livingston lure in the, in, in the presentation with that jerk master. But, uh, but a lot of times there's, there's patterns. We've, we've had several times where the old jig and the minnow actually can be the only thing but, working or the, you know, the best thing. It's a, I, I don't think we've ever seen many days when there's literally only one thing working. Although I do remember one time where the jerk master just really, really, it took a while. I remember to make- more than one time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But don't, don't stop talking about this bait yet. So the one with the, um, with the small lip is from zero to 10 feet of water. Correct. And the yeah. bigger lip, is for 10 to 20 feet of water. Now, I want to mention to the folks, again, this is a neutrally, how do you say it? It suspends naturally in the water? Yeah, neutrally buoyant is basically, it's, you know, it's it's even weight. It doesn't float up and it doesn't sink. Uh, the shallower model there that I that I showed, that uh, that is a slow float. I would call that one, uh, the deep diving model is basically, that's about as neutral as you can get. And, and this is where, you know, I, I theorize with this stuff to a certain extent with Livingston lures. I've always told people, I, I I can't be absolutely certain you get a strike because of the sound. But for those that don't know, I mean, every Livingston lure has got the EBS technology in it. That's electronic bait fish sounds. It's biologically recorded fish distress sounds. So you've got a lure that talks. It's making, it's making natural sounds. And there's, you know, there's something about a pause with the crankbait period that I think obviously the, you know, Livingston isn't the only crankbait you can catch a walleye on. They've been doing it for years and years, but it's still underutilized, I think, overall. But where where I think that that really makes a difference, and, and, and you and I end up talking about this a lot too when we're filming together, is, is how often you see just such a distinct pattern where that's on the pause only that those strikes are coming. And that's where I really, really think that that sound thing makes a difference. And in clear water a few times, We've littered, well, technically your camera, I guess, couldn't pick it up because it was it was down. But I literally saw with my own eyes multiple times where you can watch you a walleye following, believe it or not. You don't get to see it very often, but in clear water and you see the walleye coming up and I can kill that jerk master bait and just leave it sit there literally. And they will keep rising up and pluck it like a worm sometimes if, if you just literally leave yeah. it still like that it's really really pretty neat to see so uh but it's a it, it it is just a super effective bait and uh i have actually caught a few right by the side of the boat as well which is really unique uh, i mean technically you couldn't call it a figure eight like a muskie but going down you see the fish coming going down doing a little circle and that will actually hit right right by the side of the boat as well well, I got a, uh, you know, that, that was a great explanation there of, of the bait, but the retrieve is so important and the length of your pause is extremely important. Yeah. It, in reality, it's pretty, pretty sharp snaps. Okay. So you want, it's, it's mostly wrist action, but you want to make that bait dart as much as possible side to side. But, uh, you know, we talk about patterning all the time with a variety of different things. And that's something that I just do. I, I start messing around with the retrieve uh, much, much slower, much faster, longer pauses, whatever it might be. That's, that's just something that I, that I naturally do. But it's extremely important with those, uh, with those crankbaits. And, and, and I've seen days, and I know you and I have talked about it many times, where where I'm going much slower and I'm waiting much longer on those pauses. It's kind of interesting to me because it's one thing that that bait in particular has made me patient enough in the patterning process to wait longer on a pause than I ever did in my whole life of fishing. 
to be perfectly honest. Yeah. I mean, I, if I see that pattern going on, what I'll do is I'll, I'll drive that bait down a little bit and try and make sure I got a little bit of depth to it. And, and I'll start, you know, not every pause, obviously, but multiple times during the retrieve, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to be putting in long, long pauses and you'd never think it because you think a crankbait is going to be a, a faster presentation than a, than a jig and a minnow. But when I'm in that, uh, mode, sometimes I'm, I'm only getting one cast for year three. That's how much I'm yeah. pausing. And, and I've, I've literally caught a lot of fish doing that though. And it's actually, it's actually really fun. If that pattern's going, there's, there's something about that, you know, that literally just leaving the lure sit there for a couple of seconds and all of a sudden, bang, there's a fish on there. Yeah, that's cool. Um, a couple other crankbaits, obviously, if you're in a river system with current, you can't forget your flicker shad type baits and your baits that you can reel in slowly against the current. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, my bait. <laughs> oh, yeah. Can you oh, see you it there, it. the jerk minnow? I got a jerk minnow right there. But, uh, you know, I've been using this for years, and I think people that watch the show get sick of it because I use it all the time. It is not as effective as it was 10 years ago. You know, I don't know if the fish get smarter or things change, but uh, I still go to this first, uh, especially on the Bay of Green Bay. And the retrieve on this, folks, is, is, is really pretty basic. I use a, a heavy enough jig where I can get to the bottom, and I can't say enough about uh, high-vis line. And I'm using the, the Seaguar Smackdown high-vis, and I can watch my line. As soon as my line goes slack, I rip it. And some days I rip it more, depending, again, on the retrieve, like you talked about, on the jerkbait. And watch that line, because the line can be really a, a true a bite indicator. And uh, I obviously like the, the, the Kalen's ones. But uh, when you're on the Bay of Green Bay, you, uh, you can't beat a white color because those uh, f fish are, are fishing are, are eating on shad and, and white colored baits. Another thing, Pete, that's really come on really strong, and I can't explain this either, is the simple hair jig. And, you know, this, gosh, I, I think guys started using these in the late 60s, mid 60s. A guy named Jack Crawford came out with a bunch of hair jigs, and uh, they were the rage for a while. And then you didn't hear about them for a long time. But not just on the Bay of Green Bay, on many, many body, bodies of water, this hair jig has become really important. And you can see on there, Pete, that there's a, a stinger hook for early in the year. And that stinger hook can be pretty important, can it? Oh, the stinger is really something. Now, I, I got to be perfectly honest. I detest those things. It's uh, <laughs> it's hard. It's hard for me to use them because it's it's generally a little bit a uh, little bit slower, more more simple type retrieve. It doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense to me. But the the fish, it, it's amazing sometimes when they get dialed into those. And 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 for some reason, I, I I'm not sure. What's going on in their head when that stinger hook becomes more important? But it really, really is an important thing. I mean, you'll you'll do okay if you've got a hair jig with a real long shank, so you've got that that actual hook back there a little farther. But it it does seem like uh, you know at a minimum, I would have to say you're going to hook thirty percent more fish if you've got that that stinger back there, and. Uh, yeah. And just doing a, a, a you know a, a wide variety of retrieves with with those uh, you know generally generally slower. There's there's just something about that uh, that you know they're they're in the mood for that type of thing. And and uh, but uh, but again you know just from basically crawling it uh, to reel and stop. I mean there's a there, there's a bunch of ways to try them and always be varying is the key before you give up on anything in reality, but certainly before you give up on the hair jig, uh, if you're like me and it's not your fun way to do it, you still got to realize how effective it can be and, uh, you know, try, try a bunch of different uh, variations to your retrieve and speeds to your retrieve before you would give up on it. And, uh, you know, the, the yeah, other thing you know, is, uh, go ahead. 
I was going to say, you noticed last year when you and I and Blake and, and Wes Paul were fishing on the Bay of Green Bay, we made them use the hair jigs. And uh, <laughs> I was using a jerk minnow. And, you know, it really is a slow way to fish. But uh, I want to mention, too, though, one of the baits that's really effective that you like, too, are ripping type baits. Do you have one there uh, handy? A ripping type bait that uh, can be really good certain times of the spring? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, that is a uh, Livingston uh, Pro Ripper Magnum. Uh, it's real important. I, I I do tell people there's the original Pro Ripper that you'll see in the Livingston line. Uh, great baits, but it doesn't have the extra weight. It doesn't have as fast a drop. For the rip jigging technique, you want a fast drop. So for that application, you definitely want to use this Magnum. And it does it does go down hard and fast. And so essentially what you're doing is you're throwing that, that bait out. Uh, you're pausing a little bit, you're allowing for it to hit bottom. And then essentially, again, you vary this, but, uh, you know, basically pretty, pretty long lifts, pretty fast, long lifts. And you're allowing that bait to go right back down to the bottom and actually make contact with the bottom. It isn't necessary every time but that's the whole idea with it. You know, you're lifting it up hard and fast because it's weighted so much. It's dropping real fast. Generally, it's uh, once in a while otherwise, but they're going to hit it on the drop. And in a lot of cases, right. you're going to go to lift that bait again. And all of a sudden, they're just going to be there. You actually get some really hard wax with those baits as well. And it's a tremendous walleye presentation. But, you know. Because I think in a lot of cases it's a reaction strike, it does just work on a wide variety. I mean, you get, you'll get you get your pike. I've only uh, – I don't get over there as much as you. I don't know how many browns you've caught, but I've caught three browns uh, on those things as well, you know, working them hard and fast like that. And just as long as we're on this topic of the fast drop, I thought, you know, I, uh, technically it's your presentation, I guess, your uh, – Right. Your jerk, you know, but, uh, you know, that's one thing that, you know, you and I talk about and you, you do is, uh, you're, you're looking for the, you know, the fast drop or slow drop drop with that presentation. Sometimes that makes a big difference. You know, you're, you're running a heavier jig head and there's something about that being more effective where it's, uh, where it's dropping a lot faster or, for whatever reason, they're in the mood for a slower drop. And, you know, that's something you want to do, too. I mean, you you don't want to just try that bait with, okay, I got a quarter ounce jig on and that's good enough. And, you know, it might not be the right drop that they want. All of a sudden you go to three eighths of an ounce and it could be much more effective. So, you know, you definitely want to look at, at, at those things, too. But those are those are definitely some of the, you know, the, the prime presentations to – to get fish that time of the year. And of course we both detest this, but there also is the, you know, the live bait uh, mode as well. I mean, if you're, you know, especially with the electronics we've got these days, I mean, you know, let's be honest, especially on the Bay of Green Bay. I, I don't, I don't know if anybody goes out fishing anymore without looking first. Uh, you know, you're looking to right. make sure that you're, you know, <laughs> with the side imaging that you're on fish. Right. And, uh, and, you know, and that's what you do. And then you start fishing for them. That's when you start messing around with the, all of the different presentations we just talked about. But if the fish are there, uh, and they're and they're real stubborn, you know, another thing you can do is, is, is slow down and, and pitch out some live bait as well, or run a, or run a, a float behind the boat. Uh, as long as you're not drifting too fast, you know, you can run a slip bobber and, and uh, run something behind the boat, live bait to, to, to wow. see if that's the deal. And once in a while, that'll, that, that'll pull things out for you when the bite's real tough. I don't know many guys that are better on the Bay Green Bay, you know, starting in, in March and all the way through than Brett Jolly. And you know something in the springtime, in March or April, we're going out, he's always got a couple of dozen minnows in there. You know, it will start out with the artificials and, you know, if they're not hitting that, man, yeah, the old mental, I think was a year or two ago, that ended up being saving the show, you know. So, yeah, think about that. Um, other thing I want to talk about before we go to some other species that are available in April, 
Uh, along with the Pro Ripper like that, there's the Rip and Wrap. There's also the Shiver Minnow and the Cast Master Spoon. And those can be fished basically the same way. Yeah, different uh, yeah. wide variety of spoons, actually. And then the, uh, the uh, Vibrato uh, that we've used for quite a Tremendous few years. Base. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, a wide variety of spoons can be very good. And, and, and again, sometimes I don't know if it's that, you know, is it, is it the flash? Is, is it the action? But there's, you know, again, a spoon or a, or a blade bait like that is, is definitely a completely different look in a lot of cases to the fish. And, well, if and you again, hold that blade bait up again, if you can just hold that vibrato up and hold it for a second. This is an extremely effective bait, folks, to vertical jig in rivers, whether it's the Rainy River or the Wisconsin River or the Mississippi River. To vertical oh, jig, God, like, have oh, a there you go. Hey, <laughs> hey, Ryan, the photographer, isn't that kind of a nice deal there? But uh, vertical jigging those against the current uh, can be an extremely effective way to catch fish on all the river systems, right? Oh, absolutely. You don't have to untangle those. Well, I, you know, it gives me something to do while I'm talking to you here. I had to bring a whole tackle box in, of course, because I got I got spoons and a little bit of everything in here. But here we go. Uh, we Yay. should be able to see that a little better. A wonderful vertical jigging bait, isn't it? Yep, and you should be able to see the 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 hole here. You definitely one one thing I want to point out with this bait, if people haven't used it before and haven't tried them. You do not want to tie directly uh, to where <laughs> where that is there. You either want to put a split ring in there uh, or or you want to have a clip. You don't want to tie directly because it will cut you off and you will lose your vibrato, yeah. which is a bad deal. But that's just when you're vertical jigging that, it's just a slow lift. You can feel it vibrate. And then it goes down like that in a very enticing way. And that's when you normally get your hit. But I've always got blade baits in my boat in April. Oh, absolutely. And it's a boy, it's a tremendous bottom pounder. You know, it 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 drops mm -hmm. fast. There's a lot of a lot of flash. And if you know, if they're in that mood where you need to pound the bottom and stir up dirt and bang on the rocks and that kind of thing, really, really good for that. But uh, you know, you do you, you it depends on the areas you're fishing. If you're in real snaggy area, you definitely don't want to be doing that because they are no not at 10 bucks a piece yeah <laughs> the old lures were like a buck 99 you know right right uh, last bait i want to talk about walleyes when they want a little slower moving bait when you're using plastics are the old paddle tails yeah. and a lot of guys like this and they'll fish them jerk style but just a lift and a drop and that paddle tail looks really good going down slow and you can steady retrieve these too, right, Pete? Paddle tails. That's right. Yeah, I was just going to mention that if you, uh, you know, if you hadn't, there's, you know, that's that's one of those baits that could be more of a, a neutral activity type day deal where all you're all you're doing is basically crawling that thing, and uh, and and you'll see patterns like that. It's a, you know, it's kind of like the hair jig deal. You might not like it. It might not be your preferred way, but uh, yeah, I've. Uh, we, we can all be guilty of, or at least guys like us anyway, can be guilty of, you know, being too erratic and having our, our set ways of, of working our baits. And, you know, back to the, back to the whole jerk, jerk master topic to a certain extent, when you see days where they, they're only hitting them on that real long pause. I mean, that's, that, that's telling you something different too. So sometimes they just want it easy. And I think to a certain extent, that's why that long pause works with a crankbait. And it's also why just dragging a paddle tail in or a, or a live minnow at, at, at times works because, you know, they're hungry, but they're not real hungry. Now, I think we did a pretty good job covering some of our favorite techniques for the walleyes. I want to mention, too, real quickly that... Um, you know, this varies state to state, but in the state of Wisconsin now, you can bass fish year round. You can't keep any before opening day, but you can fish for them. And there's some great opportunities, you know, when the ice goes out. A lot of those smallmouth, they'll sit on the deep break lines, the largemouth too, and you can catch them on jerk type baits and other things, right? 
Oh yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's really kind of a neat option to have. Uh, and, and, and that's, that's one thing that where the, where the rivers are, are really neat around here. We've got, you know, we've got tons of river water that's, you know, really underrated. Uh, if you can, the miles and miles of the Flambeau and the Chippewa and the, and the St. Croix nearby, and, and there's just some tremendous bass fishing, especially smallmouth and, and those, and they, you know, they're, they're fairly predictable. You know, they're going to be in the deeper water out of the current a little bit. And, uh, they really, really bunch up uh, a lot too. And then, and then again, of course, I, I kind of enjoy it cause they're, you know, they're pretty good. They're, they're a little different. Sometimes they want the slower stuff too, but they'll whack crankbaits. They'll get real aggressive and they're, and they're beautiful fish that time of the year. And, Yes, you 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 definitely can't keep any, but uh, I was I was really happy when they when they open that up to catch and release fish, and it really adds another yeah. thing that you can do, you know, to get out there and and uh, you know catch catch some nice fish right away early in the season. So underrated, really neat on the uh, big green bay too. I hate to keep barping on that, but uh, the smallmouth over there gets so big, and to be able to fish those before opening day. I've seen and heard about uh, several seven-pound fish coming, pre-spawn fish coming, because those guys have an opportunity to, to fish them before they head up shallow and drop. Those are some big animals they're catching. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. I'm going to hold up something here now. Can you see me? You can see me, right? Oh, I can see you. I dropped it. I'll be right oh, back. Oh, no. There we go. Okay. Uh, I'm going to hold this up. Okay, it's also May, April is this time of year. Can you see that? My oh, I can scrub. see it. I can see it. And uh, I don't know when ice is going to go out, uh, out up north, but down here in the southern part of the Midwest, we can usually fish these by the first week of April for crappies. And it's just, to me, a hay time. I mean, you can go out. I think last year we went out and filmed the show with Maddie B. I think we caught 40 fish in a couple of hours. But it's very pre predictable down here in the southern part of the state. As soon as you find some weed growth, and it can even be last year's weeds, you know, right after ice out, that's where they are. Use your bow mount. And uh, I'm going to talk about northern Wisconsin in a second. But, as soon, you know, everybody fan casts until you get a bite. But I wanted to... You know, you and I have been using plastics for crappies together for, I can't even remember the last time we used a crappie minnow. Can you? No, no, not in spring. Now, th through the ice sometimes it seems like, but I, I, right. I just, it's so, it's so rare. Well, I know we don't bring them and it seems like, you know, we always have been able to do real well. And actually, actually, I know that uh, Tex has, uh, tried them a few times i guess when it's tougher but it you know it almost seems like it's about a hundred percent guaranteed that the plastics are better uh, without I agree. a doubt you I know mean, i was doing a seminar a month ago and i talked about that and i've gotten to the point and when i was a kid you know gold aberdeen hook a split shot and a minnow that was the way you crappie fish there was no other way but now with these soft plastics that have come out in the last couple of years um i've seen it where Rob and I were on a lake one day, 20 boats around, all soaking minnows, right? Rob takes the bow mount and goes through with the plastics, and we just slaughtered them. And, of course, all those guys with mouth wide open, what are you guys doing, you know? <laughs> but it was the plastics that made the difference. And I really do like the crappie scrub. I like the gulp one-inch minnows, too, as you know. But I also like these, uh, oh, there it is, these rocket bobbers. Um, you know, wind is a big factor in the spring usually, and you can cast these into the wind or with the wind, and they go a mile. And uh, again, that first vegetation that you see in the spring down here in the southern part of the Midwest, and uh, boy, you and I have had some great fun up in northern Wisconsin, uh, and I'm sure the same for northern Minnesota with the crappies. Generally speaking, you like to look around with the bow mount with your eyes before you start fishing. Well, that's the other, to me, fun part with a lot of it. You know, obviously, depending on what uh, what time it is, how, how how they're relating to the actual spawn itself. But uh, in a lot of cases, you can you can find them in uh, in bull rushes. Uh, you you can find them in last year's weeds. 
uh, to a certain extent, real, real shallow. And obviously a lot of this is due to water clarity and wind conditions. Sometimes you really can't effectively look around, but they will in a lot of cases be, be quite shallow. Uh, so it, it can definitely be a visual thing, but they are, uh, they're, 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 they're definitely all about cover and vegeta- vegetation to a certain extent that time of the year. And, and I'm glad you mentioned it with, with regard to the, the dead weeds as well. Uh, they will definitely use them. And any new weeds, uh, there's uh, no doubt about that. That's going to be a real hot spot. And then uh, one thing to one thing to always watch out for, it, obviously it depends on the body of water and and what's available out there. But they're, they're kind of interesting how they seem to prefer certain weed types. Uh, in recent years around here, uh, you know, it's a, it, to a certain extent, it's a dirty word, at least with the recreational people, but we have had some, uh, milfoil show up, uh, in a, in a lot of the lakes around here. And that's an interesting thing. If you're, you know, specifically, uh, looking for panfish, panfish absolutely love milfoil and, uh, really? Oh yeah. 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 They, they, they really, I I've seen, I've seen quite a few days where uh, I've actually done better in milfoil than I have in cabbage. I know that sounds awful, but uh, it's true. And, uh, and that's, the, you know, it, it, just to say weeds generally uh, is it, true. They're going to they're gonna be there. They're going to hang in them. That's what they're going to be looking for. But, but do try and pattern them for the, for the weed types because the, there's time. It's, it's just a lot thicker. But... Uh, uh, you definitely want to, you know, something like the rocket bobber is great to help you just cover more water too. I mean, it's, it's, it's general basics. It's still the first vegetation of the year, depending on how early it is. And, uh, you know, you, you just get in there and cover water and, and figure out where the fish are. And a variety of those plastics, like you say, is, is, is really the best best way to go. Sometimes they want a little different design. They want a straight tail rather than a double tail and this, that, and the other, but, uh, you know, keep trying different things. And then the, the, the thing about the plastics, to a certain extent, the reason I think it's so much more effective, sometimes they're dialed into the minnows pretty good, really, but gosh, the efficiency thing, you know, when you're, you know, you're using those plastics, I mean, how many fish can you catch? Usually, John, in a lot of cases, you at least thirty fish on one plastic, right? So you're you're not rebaiting, yeah. you're not, you're not chasing minnows around and they flop around on the bottom of the boat. You know, you're just you're just right back to fishing right away, and uh, it's it, it's just a lot of fun. Yeah, well, to summarize the crappie deal, we like the plastics, and you put like a sixteenth or thirty-two second ounce jig in the head of that. And uh, you don't need a sinker and, and a bobber. And, and don't fish too deep, folks. If you're in if you're in seven feet of water, I, I like to fish about three or four feet down. A lot of times crappies are suspended and they're looking up. And the last thing about not just crappies, but bass and other species in general, the north end of the lakes warm up the fastest. You want to try to find the warmest water for all species. Right, Pete? Yeah, I would, I would absolutely agree with that uh, to a certain extent, but it's the uh, it's the way the lake lays out too. Do you, now, usually the north end is is going to have good vegetation. That's going to be the place to be. But the, I will say that in in some cases, I've been on bodies of water where the where where the structure just dic- dictates that possibly the north end isn't isn't the best place to be all the time but warmer water is good you'll you'll see a lot of patterns with that uh i i don't know how many times where you're you know you're you're literally finding more active fish where you've got the uh three to four degree difference you know the warmer water is generally better that time of the year in just about all cases for the activity level but i guess uh, you know the only the only thing to keep in your mind there's never any kind of rules that are absolute right so if there's you know, maybe maybe on your particular body of water, there's there's crummy structure <laughs> on the north yeah. end, and a lot of your weeds are on the south end. That you know, you definitely need to to go check that out too, because there's still going to be fish there. Excellent point. Well, hey, buddy, I want to say thank you. That was a lot of fun, and uh, I want to thank our friends at Amsoil for hosting us today. And uh, 
in about three or four weeks, we're going to start previewing opening day, the month of May. We're going to talk about openers in Minnesota, Wisconsin. Okay. Uh, it'll be a lot of fun. We can talk a little bit about Canada opportunities uh, towards the end of May. So next, our next podcast is going to be about opening day in a boat. So much fun. So much fun. What a great topic. <laughs> yep. And I now that. I'm going to get going here and you got to get back out and get firewood for your furnace or you got to shovel some more, right? I have a little more shoveling. Uh, yeah. Uh, believe it or not, the folks should know that uh, I, I literally had about, uh, I don't know, a 15 foot section by, you know, three to four feet deep in front of my garage door that my boat is in and I need to get my boat ready because I know even though it doesn't uh, look like it here I know that I got to get it ready because I'm going to be on Lake Superior pretty soon with that boat so I got to get it out of there and okay. I got it shoveled out pretty good so all right buddy well hey always a pleasure and uh again thanks to Emsoil for hosting this uh every month and uh opening day preview next month all right buddy Absolutely. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I got one more thing to show, by the way, especially this time of the year, that Amsoil quick shot. You want to be. Uh, yeah, just learned my lesson on that. Yeah, this is tremendous. I just stuff. learned my lesson on that, Pete. Uh, we used last year's gas in our boat and that's a no, no. Put that in and I that will save the day for a lot of people. That'll eat up the moisture in your gas that's been sitting all winter and really help you out in all all your vehicles yeah 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 no doubt about it but uh yeah the, my i literally do not fill my boat without putting that in ever great so stuff. you got a 60 gallon tank so one of those whole bottles yeah for a for a 60 gallon and then and essentially if you uh if you have not used quick shot much it, it's basically double the dose uh, if it hasn't been used for quite some time. For me, it's standard because I, I literally, uh, you know, I, I do put it in every single time that I fill up my boat. And I, I really suggest that. But uh, if it's if it, you're newly introducing to a gas tank, then uh, the instructions are right on the bottle. You want to have uh, double the dose. And I did, You certainly our buddy Len Groom, it's one thing I don't even know if, uh, you were there when he told me that, but they, they literally ran that product. You know how much they test everything. They literally oh, ran gosh. that product 50, 50 with gasoline. And, and I forget what they were running it in, but, but it still ran good. So you can't, in a way you could argue, you can't use too much. It's, it's not going to uh, hurt your engine. So if you can run it 50, yeah, 50, that's the news. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, run them in my ATVs, my uh, seen guys, uh, snowmobiles, everything. Well, hey, buddy, I got to get moving. Uh, go shovel. I will. It's been fun. Bye.